Okay, <clears throat> we are in Genesis 12, and we've been talking about Abraham, and um, of course the the journey, the trip that he is on, has to do with uh, first and foremost finding the firstborn, finding the firstborn, figuring out who that is or who it's going to be. And that should be like the first thing that we should emphasize, not ministry, not what you can do for God, but having the firstborn revealed in you because it is Christ and it is his relationship with the Father that we are entering into. Sadly, a lot of people enter into their relationship with the Father, and it's a lesser relationship because it's not eternal. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Uh, so, um, in Genesis chapter 12, let's, uh, let's start with verse 6. We covered these verses a little bit, but uh, I think it, they're a good um, prelude to the verses that, that we'll primarily be highlighting tonight. Genesis 12, verse 6. <clears throat> and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, uh, said, unto thy seed will I give this land and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And so we see a couple of things here. In fact, let me, let me go ahead and read verses 8 and 9 too. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. All right, <clears throat> so there's um, <clears throat> some interesting um, uh, word usage in relationship to this journey. It sounds to me like his journey has a mixture of a lot of different things that's motivating him, that's moving him, that is present in him and that is identified in these verses through like verse 6 says and Abraham passed through um, and then verse um, 8 and he removed from thence and verse 9 and Abram journeyed going on still uh, you know, there is, I believe there's meant to be a tenor <coughs> in our hearts as we follow the Lord or, and that's not the best word usage because we're not really following the Lord in, in the truest sense. We're, we're allowing him to live within us, but nonetheless, let's use that because it, has, it does have truth in it when it comes to the journey, <clears throat> that there is meant to be an understanding that you're not just wandering around. Like the, the children of Israel in the book of Exodus wandering through the wilderness. They were, the term used is they were wilderness wanderers, which means basically, I mean, the, you remember when they came out of Egypt, uh, from where they were located to the promised land was an 11-day journey, right? 11 days, and they could have been in the land. Took them 40 years. <clears throat> Part of that is because we just think we, we're going to kind of go for God and we're, I'm going to trust the Lord and try to find the way and I think this is it and this will bless him and da-da-da-da instead of being in tune with his heart <clears throat> in a flow that brings about certain things. Um, 
I think there's probably uh, in the journey, in the thought of the journey, I think there's <coughs> um, probably a, um, hi Chris, um, there's probably <coughs> a lesser um, heart attention to how he's leading and what he expects in us in that journey. So um, <clears throat> we look at these scriptures and we see that there's here in this place he's passing through the land and in this place he removed from there and in this place he journeyed and you you get the feeling that he's not really in tune with the Lord. He's just kind of, well, I'm going to just pass through here and I'm going to remove from here. You know, uh, it does mention in the next verse, the Canaanite was then in the land. Um, verse 7, um, or is that the end of 6? Yeah, it's, it's in the same verse. Uh, and <clears throat> so you, we see this this um, array of different things that are going on. And, and I think in, it is possible in the heart of a person to be studying the scriptures uh, or be about their ministry, and those are within themselves guiding things that move you forward, but I believe that the like these scriptures say in in Genesis twelve six and you know all the way through it nine, I believe there is supposed to be more than Abraham passed through. You know, uh, believe it or not, God can use everything on our journey, but we're looking just for super spiritual things. You know, we're looking for you know oh yeah just one thing. But Jesus is in us at all times. He's our life. We are the habitation of God. And so um, uh, there is a journey. And, in, and as we said, this journey for Abram uh, is um, that he is, he is looking around as to who is the firstborn. And he is trying to determine that. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, I don't even think that's even in his mind yet, though. He's just, he just assumes that Lot's going to be the firstborn, you know. And, uh, and the verse before this, I think verse 5 kind of points that out. But anyway, um, so uh, he knows the Lord told him to go into the land. But wouldn't you think that if God told him to go into the land and into, Can into Canaan he went, you know, that he has no clue. He didn't know anything about this land. He didn't have Google Maps or whatever, you know what I mean? He, got, he has no clue. So what is he looking for? What is he, what is he focusing on? Well, I would assume what he's looking for and what he's focusing on are are, are two different things. One is what he's looking for is uh, the will of God, but we think the will of God is found in direction instead of a certain way of carrying ourselves in the journey. Lord, I am with you. Lord, I want to hear from you. Lord, I want to be in tune with you every step. You know, and, and that's the way it was explained to Joshua. Every place you put your foot. See, so it's a it's a... It's in those steps. It's, it's in every step. Uh, it's not just, um, and, and, and also what I'm not saying is that we're looking around at everything that we do and go, oh, where's the Lord in this? I'll tell you where the Lord is in this. He's in you. <laughs> you know? And, but he's also, you have a father, and there is a, a, um, not just a guidance, okay, so um, Google Maps says at the next street, turn right, okay. Google God says at the next place, get a job there, you know, go look at that 
store there and ask for a job or something. It's sort of the same thing. God has just glorified Google Maps in that sense. We're trying to get him to map out our lives instead of saying, uh, in other words, with Google Maps, that once you're done with it, you turn it off or whatever. And I hope you turn off location settings too. But anyway, that's just my opinion. And, uh, um, but with, with the Lord, there is, uh, I am I, with you and I hear you. And, I wanna, and if I, when I hear from you, I want to carry that forward into the next steps. Does that make sense? Um, so, like I said, Abram passed through the land, or uh, Abraham, he removed from thence, or Abraham journeyed still forward. All of those different, different descriptions of the journey are, are not really the journey. It's not all of them, but some of them are not really the journey. Uh, passing through the land because there's Canaanites there is not necessarily... Uh, meant to motivate us to move on quickly <laughs> because the next words is and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said in him unto thy seed I will give this land okay so <clears throat> so here we go you go into the land you get into the area the place called Shechem you get into that area you notice that the Canaanites are in that area that's all verse 6 Genesis 12 6 you notice all that your motives come up, your fears come up, your thoughts on where you're going and how you're going to get there. You're all, it's all really about your perception of what's going on here. And so when you get to this section where the Canaanites are there, that's where you go, okay, well, I, I'm going to move on through here. I'm going to pass through. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to just keep going. I'm going to pass right on through this before something bad happens and these people could kill me, and I'm a foreigner, and I just got here, and they're going to say, who is this, you know? I mean, it could, it, tribal things are very similar. Gang, gang mentalities are sim similar to tribal things. You know, what are you doing in our land, our, our property, our place? But immediately God appears to him and says, your seed is going to possess this land. Okay, well, there's a bunch of promise right there. One is you're going to live to have a kid. <laughs> you're not going to die here. But it's not God appeared to him and said, don't worry, I'll protect you every step of the way. Google God again. But he says, I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you the seed, which seed is Christ, it says in Galatians 3.16. I'm going to put my seed in you, and I am going to give you of my son. And so, the, so, you know, God appeared. Well, God that's saying that is the Father. And the Father has not changed one iota. He is still focus his focus is the sun and we're focused on a little tiny span of time that we live our life here trying to uh, get the d right direction oh I, I, want, I don't want to make a mistake and get off the path or whatever I'll tell you how not to get make a mistake and get off the path keep your focus on the father's heart towards the son keep your focus on the son's heart for the father and ask the holy spirit to reveal him all along the way in you and so that there's a, he must increase and i must decrease so what's going to happen if you get into a, a place that you didn't know about or whatever you have the son the father is either going to take care of his son or he's going to say i would like my son to lay down my life in this situation the, the direction has more to do with, do I lay down my life or, you know, I mean, after a while, if you get that spirit, it gets, a, it gets more difficult instead of saying, do I lay down my life or do I receive blessings? Well, we would say it's harder to lay down my life because I don't know, da, da, da. But once you get used to that lifestyle, that spirit, that nature, that being that is our father and, and the life of our vessel you actually have a harder time receiving blessings. 
You would rather lay down your life. You would choose it. You would. because Not because you, not because you're such a wonderful person, not because you're so committed, but because the son in you, because he arises and he, he dictates. We don't pick and choose those, those situations. He dictates the situations and he dictates it by the nature of his son. And if that nature arises to say, I will lay down my life for you, or if that son, uh, if that someone starts to bless and that son has to say to you because you're, you're, you get in a rut of laying down your life instead of flowing with his life, then he has to say, receive the blessings. Receive the blessings. So, so what I'm doing is I'm painting a very different picture of guidance. Um, I'm painting a, an Abrahamic picture of guidance. And, in, and melded within this, just within these scriptures that we read, um, uh, verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, unto, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And then verse um, 8, uh, yes. And he removed from thence unto a mountain of the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there builded an altar unto the Lord. Within the span of just a few verses here, you've got him in two different, in fact, it's just one verse and then the other one, um, seven and eight. <clears throat> you've got him in two different locations, but him building an altar. Within a two-verse span of the lifespan of Abraham in Genesis. You got him building altars because the, when the Lord appears to him, he, he understands the one who appeared to me, this has to do with altars. This doesn't have to do with direction. And it, you'd say, well, is that a direction? It is, but it's a direction of nature. It's not a direction of, again, Google Maps or Google spiritual maps or whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> it, uh, as long as God can intervene, and that's what it is. God is intervening in Abram's life, and he's intervening with word from the heart, not from a God who has a big plan, but from the heart of a father who wants his son and he's intervening and he's saying, unto your seed will I give this land. And you have him intervening in such a way, maybe we don't understand it, maybe we don't see it, maybe we don't understand, but in such a way that an altar springs from his being and manifests, you know, and it happens right in a row in two different locations. And it does, so it, you, what you should see from that is the location doesn't matter. <laughs> it's because the altar is consistent and the appearance of God talking about his son, <clears throat> he's consistent. God is, how consistent is he? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How consistent is he? Jesus is the first and the last. He's alpha and omega. He's the beginning and the end. We say no. He's the beginning because he created everything, and he's the end because he died for us so that we could all go to heaven. So everything in between is a free-for-all. No. No. You know, he's A to Z, Alpha and Omega. He's A and B and, you know, all the way to Z. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, so I just was moved by the fact that in this location, Abraham passed through the land. And you just notice the, the Canaanites, uh, 
in, in verse 6. You notice them, and so you know you, you, you might be able to assume that he's afraid because he's a newcomer, but then God intervenes, but God doesn't intervene and, and put a miracle bubble over him that nobody can shoot an arrow through, you know. And then he's passing through the land going, I'm safe, I feel safe, I feel... I don't want you to feel safe. I want you to feel hungry for my son. You know. Okay, I admit I'm in trouble for saying that because so many people, that's their safety is what it's about. But God will use, doesn't the scripture say all things work together for good to them that love him, to those who are called to according to his purpose? And it goes on, the next verse says, so that we might be conformed to the image of his son. All things will work to conform his son in you. He doesn't, it doesn't say all good things. It says all things work for good, but it doesn't say all things are good. And the good it works for is to be conformed to the image of his son. You, you can read it, Romans 8. <clears throat> and so... We're looking for all good things. Well, I'm a Christian, so I want all, you know, good things. Again, God is good all the time. No, he's not. <laughs> we'll kill you for saying that. <laughs> I mean, he's good all the time, but, it's, but, but that, he's not good all the time. He is all the time trying to form his son in us. He never will let up on that. He never will, because that's his heart. That's his plan. That's what he wants. So, you know, we wander off, well, but what is wandering off to God? See, we say, well, I backslid. No, you left the son. You left the heart of the father for his son, you know. But religion says, well, you, you backslid because you went and you, you got drunk or whatever. Um, you know, probably long before... You got drunk, not that, I mean, I don't drink, I don't drink not because I'm a special spiritual person or I think Christians don't drink alcohol. I don't drink because both of my parents were alcoholics and life was horrible and I didn't want that for my kids and I don't want it for you, so that's why I don't. But that's a personal thing. I don't put that on you. Go drink. <clears throat> but be not drunk with wine. Use scotch. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, everybody. I'm kidding. I'm Jewish. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Joseph's over there going, Scotch. <laughs> oh, God, don't listen to me. Just listen if the Holy if the Holy Spirit is communicating anything to you, grab what that is, but don't listen to me. <clears throat> but my point being that <clears throat> um, the uh, that the that the Father's heart is not so caught up in the circumstances as much as he is trying to get his son. Can he do something that'll break you if you go get drunk? Yeah. And will, can that breaking lead to a deeper depth and desire for the Lord? Yes. Does it always do that? No. Do you want to chance it? That's up to you. you have, well, you have free will. <laughs> All right. So um, these, you know, these verses are pretty simple here. They're not. They're not verses that we'd grab and go, oh, you know, I just saw the depth of Christ. Well, here you're seeing the depth of Christ, and you're seeing the Father's heart for his son, and you're seeing, you're seeing a reaction of one who is going to bring forth the seed, you understand, that it'll be through his lineage and everything that the Christ will come, and God chose this guy first, as it were. So, you know, so I look at it, and I go, I want my heart to quit being my heart. I want it to be one with your heart. 
I want what beats in you to beat inside of me. I don't want that by religious pursuit. I want that by um, a, a true desire that the Holy Spirit has shook me to make me realize that these things are not doctrines that we're saying tonight. These things are where God emphasizes, you know, all the way through Genesis. And, oh yeah, we shared on Exodus. Oh yeah, and Leviticus, because all the sacrifices. Oh yeah, and numbers, and, Deut and all the way through the Bible, he never changes on this subject, and he won't change because the Father and the Son, they're bound up in this, in this bond. <clears throat> and so when the Spirit of God begins to break through, not just our minds, you know, we're always trying to put all this in our mind. We go, oh, I got to get this in. Or, or how will I remember all of this? Or um, God, uh, make me more spiritual. All of those really are fretting and worrying or trying to be something to, to gain what you only get by saying, Father, if your heart truly is this way, then help me to flow with you in your heart toward your son. And Jesus, if this is your heart towards your father, then help me to flow. You're in me. I would rather, I don't want to be more spiritual. I want you, I want an increase of you. I want to be conformed to the image of the of the son. It didn't say, I want to be conformed to the image of the savior or conformed to the image of the healer. I want a ministry of healing. Well, fine, people have that, their gifts of healing. I don't care, good, go, run. But I want, I want the image of the son. It could have said the, the image of Christ, the Messiah. But it said the son. <clears throat> so, um, and, you know, let's, let's just be clear about this. Maybe everybody doesn't see this. You can't run around and go, well, you got to get this, you know, to everybody you see. Hey, bus driver, hey, stop, you know, stop looking at the <laughs> traffic and, you know, listen to me here. <clears throat> it's not about all of them. He's not trying to make his teachers. He's trying to make his preachers. No, no. <laughs> no. He's trying to conform us to the image of his son. He's trying to, and, and see, Paul got that, and he says, I travail in birth till Christ be formed in you. And he said that to Christians. I'm travailing. I'm like a pregnant woman, but you're actually the womb in that sense where Christ will be born. We're one body, as it were. We're one bride, as it were. And my travail is so that you can deliver, you know, so that you can get deliverance. No, 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 no. So you can deliver the, the seed. <coughs> All right, so. So, the, uh, so let's read verse 8 and 9 again. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Okay, so, so <clears throat> here we have um, what uh, the very first, at least 10 words within it, he removes, he removed from thence unto a mountain. And he's on this mountaintop and from this mountaintop, <clears throat> he can look on the east side, and there is Bethel, which means what? House of God. House of God. Um, which, just a little spoiler alert when you get to Jacob. Jacob gets to it, and he calls it El Bethel, which is the God of the house of God the emphasis comes off of the house and on to the God of it. 
progression, making the journey. He increases. <clears throat> so, so he looks, and to the east there's Bethel, the house of God, and to the uh, west there is Ai. Um, and Ai means ruin or destruction or, well, okay, so here he is. He's, he's going through the land, and he gets to this mountaintop where he can see direction. He can see the house of God, and he sees what, what this, this city is, is called ruin. <clears throat> and there he says, oh, Google God, show me which direction to go. I'll be using this a lot now. I'm sorry, but it's, <laughs> it's kicked in. No, he doesn't. What does he do? He builds an altar. He builds an altar. He doesn't even ask. He, put, he gives him the cross, as it were. He gives him his son in sacrifice. He takes a lamb and he offers it, and he offers it up as a sweet savor. And he's just going, I don't know what else to do. I just want to give your son. So I'm, I'm with you. That's what I'm talking about at the early part of tonight's class. The journey is supposed to have a spirit that goes with it. I am with you. I am walking in your heart, not just in your Google directions. I'm walking in your heart, and I'm walking in, I'm not just being sensitive to God. I am trying to allow his way of seeing, his way of understanding, his way of feeling to invade my alien being and to take over, as it were, so that more and more in this walk, he is increasing and I am decreasing. But also is this sense of the, of the presence of the Spirit of God. I am with and I know he's in you, but it's a sense of him that you know you're not just wandering around going, I don't think I'll go over there and, you know, bless it, okay? You know, I mean, that's the way a lot of people do. That looks like a good place. Well, that's, remember, that's what Lot does later on, and it doesn't turn out well. <clears throat> because Lot didn't have a sense of the journey. He didn't have a sense of the firstborn. He thought he was it. Help us. We think, well, I'm the one that's supposed to be blessed. And we get upset when we're not blessed because I'm supposed to be blessed. You know, I'm the heir. See, the people that do that are a bunch of airheads. <laughs> H-E, I don't know. Anyway. Because their focus is on themselves. <laughs> their focus is on themselves. They want to be the heir. They want to be the head. Well, they are the airhead, but anyway, that's, <clears throat> that probably doesn't translate in Irish, does it? <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so he has this, this choice, and he builds this altar, and you would, you would think that um, the right place to go would be Bethel, right? Because that's the house of God. You wouldn't want to go to ruin. So the right place to go would be the house of God. But <clears throat> he has made, he's put a stake down for the Lord by building that altar there. Okay. He's on the right track, but his mind is not renewed yet. Can you, can you believe that that happens? <laughs> well, you better. <laughs> <laughs> you better or there's no hope <laughs> because we do make decisions and we do stuff but there is a spirit there is a 
thing about these altars that, that is giving the father his son, that's giving a, that lamb, and it's a sweet savor unto God, there is a, this thing about that that covers. Do you understand covers? Yes. You know? But you have, to, you have to stay in tune. You know, I've heard people say, you need to stay in touch with the throne. I think you need to stay in touch with the altar. You know, you say, well, yeah, but the throne is in heaven and Jesus is on the throne. Well, Revelation describes Jesus as, in fact, it doesn't use the name Jesus there. It is him, but it's a slaughtered lamb. You can't, and, and besides the throne, uh, and if you keep going in the book of Revelation towards the, the end of it, the, you know, the, uh, John is being ushered around, and uh, this uh, angel says, have you seen the bride, the wife of the lamb? The wife of the lamb, meaning that which is joined with him. That doesn't have to be male or female in our mind. Spiritually, it is that which is joined to the lamb in spirit, but not just joined um, um, officially as a Christian, but like a marriage, like a union, like a, like a, a, I don't know. And he says, no, I haven't seen that. I walked with Jesus. I saw Jesus for three and a half years. You know, I saw the disciples. Well, you had to be caught up to see that, remember? And so he came, and he comes and he shows him, and there is the lamb on the throne. And out of the throne is flowing this water, and it's the river of life. And everywhere it goes, it brings healing to the nations. But in a sense, you don't see the bride, but you do, because it says there is New Jerusalem. And the city is made of transparent gold. It's made of that which is clear, so that you, when you look at her, you don't see her. You see what's in her, which was the throne and the lamb and where it flows from. Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Well, stop trying to do that by, you know, uh, storing up, like squirrels, storing up nuggets of you know, <laughs> scriptures that I hope it'll flow out when the time comes. Um, get the lamb enthroned on the inside of you. Because that's where it flowed oh, out yeah. from. But it also flowed out of her, didn't it? So <clears throat> there is that difference between the throne and the lamb. There's a, the lamb is a lamb. The throne is a throne, and he's the thing that makes it important. The same with the cross. Didn't we just talk last night about this with the cross? <laughs> it's not two pieces of wood. It is the fact of his spirit and his nature that makes the wood worth anything, and it's the same thing with the throne. So we're not trying to get in touch with the throne. We are trying to get in touch with the God of the altar. We want to know the guy who, you know, who started this whole thing and just, you know, I mean, remember, we came out of sharing on um, Cain and Abel, and the altar was the big divider there. What was on the altar? Abel offered up. He didn't even offer the first fruit. It doesn't say he offered the first fruit, which would have been representative of the firstborn. He just offers fruit. And Abel offers the firstlings of the flock. That's, that's little baby lambs. <laughs> Slaughtered. God goes, oh, I like that. You go, what? God, are you? You're sick. No, he's not. That's his son. That's his self-giving son who will die for you. Thank God for that slaughtered little lamb. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So, <clears throat> here we are. We're with Abraham, as it were, in him, looking at this. <clears throat> and the 
see the situation. And there he builds this altar. And there he says, I don't really know. And I don't really think it's necessarily about direction. I think it's about my heart being with you. I think it's, uh, and see, this is, a, this is a great thing that's going on in him because he's, he's dedicated to bringing forth this seed. He just doesn't know who it is, but he's doing it through these altars. <laughs> see? So that's a clear indication that he doesn't fully understand all of this, but he knows that that pleases God. You know, uh, Noah, when the flood subsided, he got out and he offered up and he says it was a sweet savor to the Lord. It brought pleasure to the Lord. Um, you begin to, to uh, and then, you know, for example, Leviticus and, all, you know, all the way through, they are constantly offering up lambs. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that brings me back. We need to know this God of the altar. We need to know him beyond our understanding of a lamb because there, every lamb and every lamb that's put on an altar is only a vague shadow of the real, just very vague shadow. So we can't look at a lamb and go, oh, I'm going to understand Jesus by staring at this thing. You're not. You're not. Um, take it, put it on an altar, kill it. Now I'm going to really understand this by that. Well, I think you're closer to his nature. You understand what I mean? I think you're closer to understanding him when you add the altar in. But you're not going to know it by a, a shadow lamb and a shadow altar. You're not going to know it by two pieces of wood and the story around those pieces of wood in the Gospels. Paul describes it as the revelation of Christ, the unveiling of Christ, the opening the eyes of our understanding that we may know what is the hope of his calling, why he called us. And, he's taught, and that's, of course, said to the church at Ephesus, a church, believers. So, and there it says, and he called upon the name of the Lord called upon the name of the Lord and it doesn't give us an indication that he's calling for direction it gives us an indication that he, that he views prayer like an altar and like a slain lamb here's the altar Here's the slain lamb. This will come into play later, right? <laughs> here's the altar. Here's the slain lamb. And here is my prayer going up with it. Okay, well, can anybody think of places where scripture, I mean, where in, in scripture where prayer is equated with the altar and with incense and with, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of places. David really saw that. David really understood that. Um, <clears throat> may my prayer be as the fat of rams and bullocks and well what does that mean then what does that mean you know I don't know maybe God likes the smell of burning fat no <laughs> you know no it is that that which is given isn't self-centered Okay, how many prayers prayed in this country and say one day might be self-centered? Just, just give me a random number. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, you know. <clears throat> and, and I don't care about that. I'm, I am making a contrast, but I'm not making a contrast to... to look down on people. Do you understand that? I'm not doing that. I'm trying to say we need this, this altar, this God of the altar. Yes. 
we need to understand him. We need to, to quit just having the American Jesus that comes and blesses and does all this kind of stuff. I mean, what about, what about all these people in countries where life is horrible and, you know, women are raped and kill, kids are killed and, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, mobs rule or, or gangs rule or all this kind of stuff. Is it possible to find Jesus in those situations? Well, look at Jesus on the cross. Look at, look at your Savior. <laughs> if, if you don't want to get too spiritual, then just look at your Savior. If that's all you see him as, look at your Savior and what he went through and the, the abuse and all that kind of stuff. And yet, he was a sweet savior to the Father. Amen? And there goes, here's, here's the cross, and here's the lamb nailed up to it, and here's the sweet savor rising. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Do you see it? There it is. That's the real. That's as real as it's going to get right there. And until we can get to a place where <clears throat> the altar and the, you know, and of course, we always view the altars here as very reverent, special religious significance and all this kind of stuff. But they all picture Christ being abused and, by, and being murdered and being uh, falsely accused and all of this stuff. That's what they all are a picture of, right? But they're also meant to be a picture because when God says, I smell a sweet savor even from the shadow. His son is so deeply in his heart that he knows what his son is like. He knows that spirit. He loves that spirit. And he, he sees even the shadows, you know, until a certain time when you get to the prophets and actually earlier than that, but a certain time <clears throat> when God says, I hate your sacrifices. I hate your offerings, you know. And he's the one who told him to do it. He didn't say do it in that spirit. He didn't say make it selfish. Or he didn't say just uh, try to get out of what you did wrong and then come back and do another one and get out of what you did wrong and then. Amen. <clears throat> Romans 7. Um, and. Six. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbids it. Okay, why? Because God is a God against sin. No. God is against us coming to him on these altars, which is the altar of Christ giving himself for us and just doing it to spare our flesh. He wants his son. It's not, I, I, he's, he's not, here's, here's, the, here's the true label for God in many people's minds. He is the anti-sin God. No, he is the pro-Jesus God. And he gave us Jesus. If we're born again, he's in there. So there's every reason that we can, it takes a while, we need to grow up in him. It says that in, in Colossians, that we may grow up into him in all things who is the head, okay? And we're the body. Okay, yeah, it does. I mean, we're going to mess up, and I'm not saying we don't have forgiveness of sin and stuff. I'm, in fact, I'm not even saying any of that. I'm just quoting Romans 6, where he says, God forbid, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, and he says, how shall we that are dead unto sin live any longer in it? Well, then he goes and starts talking about Christ. Well, we've, the whole reality is that we are brought to death so that Christ may dwell in us, so that he may proliferate, so that it, we wouldn't have to have an altar for our sin all the time. We would have an altar for him to just lay down his life anywhere and anytime he wants to through us as his body. Does that sound okay? Yeah. 
In verse 9, and Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. <clears throat> okay. So here we go. <laughs> we're we're going to stop on verse 9, but here we go. <clears throat> if you know the story, you know where he's heading, right? This, uh, let me see if I can, in, in one word, just give me one word that, that describes where he's going. And don't say Egypt. <laughs> Anybody? He's fulfilling the pattern. What? He's fulfilling the pattern. Exile. He'll be exiled from the land just like the prodigal son ended up in the hog pen, and just like Israel ended up down in Egypt, he's going to have very similar circumstances as what Israel had in Egypt because it's the pattern. It's the pattern for bringing forth the firstborn. So it's, it's just good. It's good stuff. I hope you're... Hope you stay hungry. Amen. <coughs> what does that commercial used to say? say stay thirsty, my friend. <laughs> stay hungry for Jesus, my friends. Father, we seek you. We, we are in a journey where our hearts are with you. We're not just looking for you to give direction for everything in this earth. You're, you want to give direction for the nature in which we display in the earth. And that nature is Christ, and that spirit is a selfless lamb, a, a, a harmless lamb that put himself into that situation to show what you're really like. Father, help us to, to, to pursue you as you are and not as we have perceived you and not as we have been taught of man, but that your spirit, not even as I have taught, Father, but as the Spirit will teach us, we will stay hungry. We will continue to seek you and love you and want you and go after you with all that is within us. And you said that. All the, uh, with all my mind, all my strength. Well, I don't have much strength and I don't have much of an understanding in my mind. But I'm going with all my mind that I got and all my strength that I've got. So receive it and give us your son. Feed us on the bread of life. Fill us up. Like David said, my cup runneth over. Fill us up with Jesus till he manifests to those outside of us. We ask in Jesus' name.